Okay, so welcome to MathStat 341 Probability. This is the first real lecture. It takes a while to get the camera to track. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to do two things today. Since I forgot the birthday hats at home, I will do the birthday problem second, so that if we run out of time, I have a chance to bring them for Wednesday's class. I will start off with playing a game of hoops. Okay, uh, how many of you have never played basketball before? And you're one of the two volunteers, wonderful. Okay, we're going to play a really simplified version of basketball. First person to make a basket wins. Now this is a theoretical math class as well as an applied stats class. So for this demonstration, we will be theoreticians. So I'm going to make some unreasonable assumptions, I believe, about our two contestants. The first is that they always shoot with the same probability of success. It may not be the same for each of them, but they always shoot with the same probability of success. They never tire. So if they're doing this for 20 years, they're not getting tired, they're not getting better, they're not getting worse, they're always getting a basket with the same probability. The first one to get a basket wins. Do you want to go first or second? Okay, you spoke first, so you get to go first. All right, so we'll shoot from over there. So one of my two contestants move. Whoever wins the game, you do feel the class, however, if you hit the iPod. Oh, absolutely, yes. It's Ready? So first basket wins. This is close. It hit the okay. It hit the tripod, not the iPod. So you still have a chance for the semester, but you are in a dangerous situation. So we might want to move you up for the rebound. Yeah. Right. <coughs> Go for it. All right. We're going to have the two of you move in a little bit so we get the class done today. Nice shot. All right, so you have two problems in the bank. You have one problem in the bank. Thank you. Okay. And then the basketball coach may be contacting you. Probably not, but... All right. So hopefully it's clear why this is being done in a probability class. All right. What do you think we want to compute? Yes. Yeah, good. Probability somebody wins. So this is the basketball game. So in the interest of not making anybody feel good or feel bad, we will give the people the classic names B for my favorite Larry Bird and M for Magic Johnson. All right, I know you should probably update these to more current basketball players, but I grew up in the 80s. And so I will go with uh, two of my favorites. All right. Let's let XB be the probability bird wins. And we'll let XM be the probability magic wins. So the probability bird gets a basket. I'll call that P sub B. The probability magic gets a basket. I'll call that P sub M. And bird shoots first. First basket wins. It's entirely coincidental that the Celtic gets to shoot first. Okay. Normally, you would not use this. You would normally say P is the probability of bird, and maybe Q is the probability of magic. Why do you think I'm doing P sub B and P sub M? It's easier to understand. It's easier to understand. Notation is extremely important. I want to be able to look down and quickly see what's going on. And so I often like to have my notation a little bit more involved than necessary. Uh, how many of you know what cosecant of x is? Yes, what is it? Uh, yes. Isn't that disgraceful? It is, it is horrible notation. Someday, hopefully, one of you will become a multi-trillionaire, and you can force the mathematics community to change the notation, or you'll make sure that there's no funding. This is horrible. What should cosecant be? 
should be one over cosine. Cosecant should go with cosine, secant should go with sine. This is very confusing notation. Notation matters. All right, we want to calculate the probability that bird wins. So what we're going to do is we're going to split the game <coughs> into different scenarios. So what's one way bird could win? So bird could make the first basket. And that happens with probability PB. So first basket. How else could bird win? Yes? Almost, not quite. You want to correct. So you have, what shot is Bird winning on? So he has to miss. So he has to miss. Then Johnson misses, then he misses. Good. So it's first Bird misses, catastrophe, then Magic misses, which is good, and then Bird gets the basket. Well, we're going to introduce some notation. Let's let R be 1 minus PB, 1 minus PM. So this would be the probability that bird and magic both miss. So this is uh, the third shot or bird's second. And so if I use R for that, I can write it a little bit more concisely as they both miss and then bird hits. And you can see the power of notation. All right, how else could bird win? We'll do one more. Yes? R squared. R squared. So bird misses, magic misses, bird misses, magic misses, bird gets it. So that would be two misses of each, and so on and so on and so on. So we get an infinite series. We notice that every term is multiplied by p sub b. So we get the probability bird wins is p sub b times 1 plus r plus r squared plus r cubed plus dot, 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 dot. And what is this quantity? Yes? It's an infinite geometric series. So if we knew the formula for the infinite geometric series, we'd be done. How many of you know the formula for the infinite geometric series? OK, not everyone. Those of you who know it, keep your hands up. How many of you can prove it right now? OK, so a couple of hands are still up. Some hands are kind of waving. So, well, you know, the author he's going to ask me to prove it right now is kind of small. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, a lot of these things are gambles. So there is a way to prove the infinite geometric series from the game of hoops we just played. So this is one of the reasons I like this. This is not just a cookbook problem. The solution, or the good solution to this problem, involves one of the most important concepts in mathematical economics. All right, let's calculate the probability Bird wins another way. So Bird could get his first basket. Now, assume Bird misses and Magic misses. What is the probability Bird wins once he and Magic have both missed their shots? The same as the probability when he initially started. And what's that probability? No, PB is the probability Bird makes his next shot. I'm not asking the probability he makes his next shot. I'm asking what's the probability Bird wins the game? Uh, X sub B. X sub B. Why is it X sub B? Because the situation is fundamentally the same situation you're in. Excellent. It's the same situation. It's a memoryless process. I have made a bunch of unreasonable assumptions. But I said that this is a fundamental idea in mathematical economics, so unreasonable assumptions is, of course, reasonable. It's a memoryless process. Does it matter how we got to this state? Does it matter if they had just started playing, if they missed 12 shots, if they missed 12,000? No, I made the unreasonable assumption that they never tire, and they never improve, and that the rate of getting a basket is always the same. Are these reasonable assumptions? No. But for this problem, we've made those assumptions, and we can see what that leads to. One of the consequences of that assumption is that once they both miss, it's like we've reset the game and we're playing it all over again. And now that we're playing it all over again, by definition, that's just XB. Well, now we can solve for XB, and we get XB, I have to do a little bit of algebra, is PB times 1 over 1 minus R. So you would just subtract 
Rxb from both sides, you get 1 minus R times Xb is Pb, divide by 1 minus R. Well, these two things must be the same. They both have a Pb, so therefore, this part here and this part here must be the same. And this is the geometric series formula. Okay? Now, we always want to be careful. So we have the infinite geometric series formula. So 1 plus r plus r squared plus dot 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 is 1 over 1 minus r. We can sometimes write the sum as r to the n, n goes from 0 to infinity, is 1 over 1 minus r. Whenever you see an equation in mathematics, you should always be asking, when is it valid? What are the assumptions? Then you can ask, are these assumptions reasonable? Can I actually use this equation in real life? Later in the semester, we might actually talk about the Great Recession and how a mathematical equation was being used in situations it should not have been used at. What do you think we might need for this to work? Yes? Uh, R less than one. Almost, but not quite R less than 1. Yeah. The absolute value of R, because if R is negative 5, so one of the things is we're adding a bunch of terms. If, this, if the terms don't individually go to zero, there's no way the sum can converge. So I need the terms to be going to zero, so I need the absolute value of r to be less than one. So no matter what, I need that assumption. It turns out that that assumption is also sufficient if the absolute value of r is less than one. What's one plus two? plus 4, plus 8, right, plus 16, 31. It's, it's always 1 less than a, so if I go on infinitely far, what does it equal? Well, I'm taking infinitely many sums, summons. Negative 1. Why would I write negative 1? <laughs> Some of you might be thinking, we're paying how much for this class? Yes. <laughs> well, wait, if you use the formula unthinkingly, that's what you get. I'm not using it unthinkingly. I'm thinking. I'm just not thinking well. You know, I'm not checking to see, are the assumptions of the formula met? It turns out that this actually makes sense. And there's something called periodic mathematics. And in periodic mathematics, this is correct. And this is basically just taking r equals 2. And it gives you the strange result that the sum of all the powers of 2 is so large, it goes past positive infinity and starts climbing up and almost reaches 0 again. Another way of looking at it is you have this series expansion. And this series expansion, if the absolute value of r is less than 1, the left-hand side equals the right-hand side. The left-hand side only makes sense if r is less than 1 in absolute value. The right-hand side, however, makes sense for every value of r other than 1. So what we can do is we can use this to extend what we mean by this sum to other values. And it turns out that this has important consequences. I will just leave you with one more example. Um, 1 plus 2 plus 3 is plus 4 plus 5. And if we go all the way to infinity, we get... Negative 1 12th is correct. A little bit larger than the sum of all powers of 2, which makes sense because we have more numbers. There are ways to interpret this. This involves what's called the Riemann zeta function. And the whole idea is you can often have these formulas, and the formula makes sense in one place, and we have a way to extend it to another. We will use this when we get to Stirling's formula to estimate n factorial. Not this exact result, but this idea of taking something that works in one regime and extending it to another and using that to get information. So the goal for today's lecture is to try to show you what we're going to be doing in the semester. So you can figure out, is this the class I want to take? Okay. We will not have a basketball net every day. This is false advertising. All right. Or at least it's no longer false advertising because I've said that. All right. But I will try to have examples and stuff like that. So this is a beautiful result. This is memoryless processes. This is a huge idea. If you can reduce yourself to a previous state, you can get the answer very quickly. 
sometimes you might have more than one possible state. Question or? Okay. All right, so any questions about this? I want to end with one little thing. So we haven't proven the geometric series formula. Uh, how many people want to see a real proof of the geometric series formula? All right, a couple of hands went up, so I'll, I'll, I'll do the really quick proof. So let's let Sn be 1 plus r dot 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 plus r to the n. If you multiply by r, you just slide everything down by 1. And so you get r plus r squared plus r to the n plus r to the n plus 1. What should we do to both sides? Subtract. I mean, we get 1 minus r times Sn. Ooh, look at all that cancellation. It is 1 plus, I'm sorry, 1 minus r to the n plus 1. And thus we get Sn is 1 minus r to the n plus 1 over 1 minus r. You can write that as 1 over 1 minus r minus r to the n plus 1 over 1 minus r. And so now if we take the limit as n goes to infinity, if the absolute value of r is less than 1, you see this term will go to 0 and it will converge to 1 over 1 minus r. And you can even see how rapidly it's converging. So this is a nice, rigorous proof of the geometric series formula that you can do in a math class and look like a real mathematician. To me, it's not nearly as much fun as you know, shooting a basketball. It also doesn't give you the idea of the memoryless process. OK? So this is just you know, the rough standard proof. I think this is in the book as well. Let's go back to what we did over here. What can you tell me about the value of r in this game? Yes? It's between 0 and 1. So we've got to be a little bit careful, because the geometric series formula is not supposed to hold when r equals 1. So for us, we had r was 1 minus probability bird making a basket, 1 minus probability magic. Each one of these numbers is between 0 and 1. So each factor is between 0 and 1. So their product is between 0 and 1. So we have 0 less than or equal to r less than or equal to 1. We would have an issue if r equals 1, right? Because the geometric series formula should collapse. Issue if r equals 1. All right, well, what would happen if r equals 1? Yes? The basketball game is trivial. Okay, why? Because it would be impossible for r Yeah, so if r equals 1, this means the probability that bird gets a basket is 0, and the probability magic gets a basket is 0. First basket wins. <laughs> No one is going to win. So things should break down in the case when r equals 1. Let's go back to the geometric series formula. xb would be 1 over 1 minus r times the probability that bird makes a basket. We're going to be having 0 over 1 minus 1. That's 0 over 0. Is there a way to interpret 0 over 0? Does it matter how we get to this? You know, does it matter the rate at which PB is going to 0 and PM is going to 0? Can you get different answers? So this is a fun thing to play with. Imagine you have different choices of the rate at which PB and PM go to 0. What would you get here? Would this formula have a limit? What's the simplest way to send PB and PM to 0? Send them together. Let you know, PB equal PM equal, say, 1 over N, which goes to 0. You could also have maybe pb equals 1 over n, and pm equals 1 over 2n. And see what happens in that case. Or maybe 1 over n squared. And if they have different rates at which they go to 0, what happens? I don't necessarily expect all of these rates to be the same. But it is nice that our formula gives us 0 over 0 and is flagging that something is going wrong here. Now, the other thing is, the geometric series formula is supposed to hold for the absolute value of r less than 1. This is only working when the absolute value of r is between 0 and 1. This does not handle negative r's. So there is a way to modify what we've done to handle negative r's. So as extra credit, think of how you would handle negative r's. Now, can you have a negative probability? 
new. Okay? It does not matter how bad you are. You do not have a negative chance of getting a basket. Okay? And I know some people here don't think they have great basketball skills. I assure you, you are not going to have a negative basket chance. Okay? So if we're going to try to extend this to negative values of R, it can't be exactly the same as the shootout game. Okay? So any questions about this? So this problem has a lot of the key ideas that we'll see in the class. It has breaking up a complicated event into a bunch of simpler events. The events are mutually dis um, disjoint. They can't happen simultaneously. We calculate the probability of each, and then we sum them together, and we get the probability we want. We have the idea of a memoryless process. We have the idea of some analysis and infinite series. So how many of you have taken real analysis? OK, so the rest of you are planning on taking it. Wonderful. Excellent. Great class to take. Okay? Real analysis is a wonderful way of making things precise and rigorous. So a lot of what we're doing this semester, if you've done real analysis, that gives you the tools to make a lot of this rigorous. Until we get to the central limit theorem, where real analysis is not enough, and we have to go to complex analysis. So it turns out complex analysis is much more powerful than real analysis for a lot of things. And the reason is, and we'll talk a little bit about this later in the semester, is complex analysis is a very exclusive subject. It only lets nice functions in. And these functions have additional properties. It shouldn't be surprising that the more nice properties your functions have, the more nice things you can conclude about them. Real analysis lets too many functions into play. And we'll talk about that later in the semester. OK, so this was the basketball problem. We're all fine on the basketball problem. All right, the next one is the birthday problem. How many of you have heard of the birthday problem? Excellent. So there's a lot of different versions. Um, is the, I'm going to assume that everybody here is comfortable sharing their birthday in public. If you are not, please randomly choose a day between um, January 1st and December 31st. All right. Is there anybody here born on February 29th? Do you know why? Yes? The only thing I So it seems unlikely that there could be somebody, but you know, it's possible. I actually have a deal with admissions. I do a lot of recruiting dinners for them, lectures over the summer and whatnot for prospective students. And so the deal we have is that no one is allowed to be enrolled at Williams who was born on February 29th unless they do not take my probability class. Because it completely screws up this analysis to have to deal with February 29th birthdays. See, you don't know yet if I'm joking. I actually, I think I actually still have it in my office. Uh, there was a recruitment dinner for some prospective Williams students a few years ago, and I convinced the director of admissions to offer free admission to all the prospectives at my table if the following did not happen. If you looked at all the people at that dinner, if there weren't two people who shared a birthday, then everybody at my table gets free admission. So boy, did my students scamper through the uh, dining room to get people's birthdays. How many people in the dining room? Over 100. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, so when you see the calculation, <laughs> you realize I am extremely safe. I had to go down though to admissions and actually show them the calculations, and I also had to put up some of my own money. My wife only found out about this uh, last night <laughs> at a uh, faculty event when I was, she was like, how much did we go? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, I mean, the, the, the odds deal. So hopefully she'll still be home later tonight with the kids. OK, so birthday problem. So how many people in room before have a 50% chance to share a birthday. All right, is that clear? I want to know how many people do I have to have in a room before I have at least a 50% chance that two people share a birthday? In particular, do you think this class is large enough that I'm safe? Okay, if it is not the case, then everybody gets 100 on homework number two. But I will trust people to be honest and to use their real birthdays. Deal? Yeah. All right, collective enforcement. Okay. Is this a well-formulated problem? Is it clear? Yes. Um, are we asking only two or? 
So good. So I, I would say at least two. At least two people share both. So there could be multiple pairs of two. There could be a triple. There could be a quadruple. But I want to have at least two people in the classroom. Yes. So more what assumptions do we need? So, so one thing is, well, I mean, we could still have it, but it makes the analysis a little bit different. So we need to have, in some sense, what is the probability? Yes, for every day of the of the year for birthday. There doesn't need to be equal probability, but we seem to be assuming that all days are equally likely. I'm not going to get into biology classes and stuff like that. That is not my uh, jurisdiction. Let's assume all days are equally likely. Yes. We have to make sure there's no sets of twins. My wife is an identical twin. So if there is a family reunion on her side, it's extremely likely that there are two people who share a birthday, even if it's a small reunion. Okay. So let's assume that they are not, you know, that everybody is completely independent from everyone else, that all days are equally likely, and that nobody was born on February uh, 29th. So there's 365 possibilities. So let's let x be our probability. And we could say maybe xn is the probability that no two share a birthday with n people. OK? So in probability, it's sometimes easy to calculate the complementary event. If I want to calculate the probability something happens, it's often easy to calculate the probability something doesn't happen and then subtract that from 1. Right. So again, this is another way to see one of the key ideas of the, of the semester. So I want to calculate the probability that two people don't share a birthday. What's x1? The probability that two people don't share a birthday. Yes, 1. This is not a hard calculation. Right? There's only one person in the room. It's pretty unlikely they share a birthday with anyone else. There's a lot of ways of writing 1. I'm going to write it as 365 over 365, or 1 minus 0 over 365. Lots of ways of writing 1. Let's calculate the probability that two people don't share a birthday. What's the probability? 364 out of 365. And I'm going to write that as 1 minus 0 over 365 times 1 minus 1 over 365. So the reason I'm writing it like this is the first person walks in and all days are available for their birthday. The second person walks in and one day is no longer available. So if I were to have three people, what would it be? Yes? So th say it again. The numerator would be good. Good. 364 times 363 over 365 squared, or 1 minus 0 over 365. That's a horrible 3. Dot dot dot. 1 minus 2 over 365. And more generally, if we have n people. It would be 1 minus 0 over 365 all the way down to what? Yes? And minus 1. Right. So the way to minimize your chance of making an error is to always look at some special cases. If I have, t if I have 3, I go all the way down to 2 over 365. So if I have n, I'm going to go all the way down to n minus 1 over 365. So I can write this in a more concise manner. So the more concise way of writing this is xn is the product, k goes from 0 to n minus 1, of 1 minus k over 365. So I'm just using product notation rather than some notation. How many of you have ever taken a class in product theory? Excellent. How many of you have ever taken classes where you've dealt with sums? Good. Okay. Riemann sums, for example, which leads to integration. Okay. So the question is, 
I want to convert this to something I can understand. I really don't understand products well, but I understand sums. Do we know any way to convert a product to a sum? Take the log. So you should have a Pavlovian response for the rest of your life. Whenever you see a product, your first thought should be take a log. Okay. If you, I know some of you are volunteering in the elementary school. If you happen to be in the elementary school, it's a fine first thought to have, but just catch yourself before you do it in public. Okay. But you should always be thinking when you have a product, take a log. It converts a multiplicative process to an additive one. It doesn't really matter which one you study, except for the fact that we have a lot more experience studying sums. So it makes it friendlier to us. So we get the log of xn is now the sum, k goes from 0 to n minus 1, of the log of 1 minus k over 365. This product is a real pain to evaluate. You know, as you take larger and larger and larger n's, your multiplication is horrible. Your numerator is growing, your denominator is growing. You might have to be multiplying in pairs. You know, maybe I multiply, then divide, then multiply, then divide. And as I'm doing this, it's, I've got to worry about rounding errors. So the multiplication is a pain. The addition is much nicer. How many of you remember calculus? This is almost who's awake right now. If you don't remember calculus, uh, you need to learn it very quickly. Okay? What's the main idea of derivatives? Anybody know why we care so much about derivatives? It was just a fun class. It was the next thing to do after <laughs> trig, so, you know. Yes, why do we? I mean, I guess like when you look at a function on a really, really small window. Yes. Good. So one of the main ideas of differential calculus is locally, every function looks like a straight line. And straight lines are easy to analyze. This is your tangent line approximation. So tangent line approximation. And if you do a Taylor series expansion, if you do an expansion, you get the log of 1 minus x is minus x minus x squared over 2 minus x cubed over 3 minus yada, yada, yada. It's approximately negative x. If x is small, this is a pretty good approximation. You know, if x is about 1 over 100, x squared is about 1 over 10,000. So the area is pretty small. So what we're going to do is I'm going to just approximate this right now. Let's say the log of xn is approximately the sum k goes from 0 to n minus 1 of negative k over 365. OK? So I would get negative 365, the log of xn, is equal to the sum k goes from 0 to n minus 1 of k. So I'm going to violate something I, I mentioned earlier. I will say that I bought the basketball net half for my classes and half for my kids. It's worthwhile combining things whenever possible to be efficient to get multiple credit. Anybody recognize this? I'm looking at somebody in particular. I'm actually looking at a few people. Where have you seen this before? There's at least two people here who have seen this before. Where have you seen this? Last class. Last class. We did this at 9 o'clock. It's a great way when you're teaching to try to have the same material in two different classes. Get paid twice for the same thing. Wonderful. So it's nice that we actually have to evaluate the sum in both classes. So there's a beautiful formula for this. So the sum, k goes from 0 to n minus 1 of k, is n minus 1 times n over 2. If you've ever done proofs by induction, this is one of the big things you do by induction. Uh, usually to do it a little bit more friendly, instead of doing it to n minus 1, people might just do it to n. Just really shifts things, not a big deal. Okay? I'll do the more general case. I'll prove it goes up to n, and I'll, sh I'll, I'll use a different letter. I'll, I'll say it goes up to m, and I'll show it's equal to m, m plus 1 over 2. So one of the most entertaining stories about this problem goes back to when Gauss was in school. His t I'll try to tell it almost the same, and you can tell me how close I am. His teacher was having a bad day and wanted to shut the little brats up. 
So one way you do this is you give them a tedious problem that no one cares about that will just force them to spend a lot of time computing. So the teacher had them add all the numbers from 1 to 100. And then the teacher goes, ah, bliss. And then Gauss yells out the answer. Go, what? Just a few moments later. So what Gauss noticed is take the numbers 0 plus 1 plus 2 plus m, call that just some s, and write the numbers backwards. m plus m minus 1 plus 0. I won't tell you how old he was when he noticed this. Each of these sums up to m. And how many peers do we have? m plus 1, because you know we have m plus 1 numbers. So m times m plus 1 is twice s. So s is equal to m, m plus 1 over 2. So using that, this sum over here is now n minus 1 times n over 2. OK? All right, so again, I could be a little bit more careful. I could be a little bit more rigorous. I want to show you the power of just approximations. So we now have the log of xn, and we're multiplying it by negative 365, is approximately equal to n minus 1 times n over 2. I'm going to approximate that by n minus a half squared over 2. Is that a horrible approximation? I don't need to do this, but by doing this, I no longer have to use the quadratic formula to solve for n. And what do we want x sub n to be? We want it to be a half. So solve for n to make xn equal 1 half. Well, if I put in a half here, the log of 1 half is the same as negative log 2. So the negatives cancel, and we get 365 log 2 is equal to n minus 1 half squared over 2. I bring the 2 over, and I'm going to write it as 365 log of 4 is equal to n minus 1 half squared. There's a reason why I don't want to multiply 365 by 2. I want to say 2 log 2 is the log of 2 squared. So now I take the square root, 365 log 4, and I add a half, and this should all be approximates, and that should approximately be, we'll call it n star. We'll give it a special name now. It should be approximately n star. So if somebody has a calculator, you want to calculate the square root of 365 log 4 plus a half. If not, I'll punch it up. But this should be extremely close to the actual answer. And if you want, we could go through the analysis and see how much we're missing by. So this will tell us how many people we need to have in the room before we have a 50% chance that at least two people will share a birthday. Now, of course, the question becomes, as we start exceeding this number, OK, did you get an answer? What, 15? Are you doing the log base e? Okay. So in any math class that's a theoretical math class, log is always log base e. So this should be around 22. 22.9, what is it? OK. So it basically tells me when I have about 23 people we're safe. If you want, you can see how much of a harm was there in replacing the n minus 1 times n with n minus a half squared. This is a theme we will return to throughout the semester. When we get to the central limit theorem, we're going to replace sums of random variables by saying, eh, whatever their distribution is. It's almost always close to this other distribution, this Gaussian, which is much easier to analyze. And we want to control maybe what kind of error do we make when we do this approximation. So this is just telling us how many people we need to have before we have a 50% chance. You could then, of course, say, well, what if I want to have a 90% chance? What answer do I want? Well, all I would do is I would change the 2, or really the, the uh, 1 half, to 0.9.
And you can see how the answer is going to depend on that probability. What if we had more than 365 days in a year? That's why I didn't want to do the multiplication. If there were 1,000 days in the year, you would just place 365 with 1,000. All right, so shall we go around and see birthdays? All right, so as soon as you hear a birthday that matches your own, shout out. It does not have to be same year. January 21. Okay, sorry? Already got it. <laughs> All right. So then the question, of course, becomes, how many matches do we have in this class? Now, of course, the match was you know, pretty far down, but we already had the match. Do we have any triples? Do we have any quadruples? I, actually, I, I probably have access to all this data if I wanted. It's amazing what they give professors. Uh, I really don't care about people's names. If people want to, we could actually do the analysis and just have some kind of Google Docs where people put their birthdays. I don't, if people are interested, let me know. It's an interesting question. What kind of matchings will you have in this small space? How likely are these things? In the textbook, I have an excerpt from a wonderful book by Malcolm Gladwell on outliers, where what he does is he replaces the names of the kids in the Canadian Junior Hockey Championship with their date of birth. And what you basically see is all the kids were born in January, February, March. January 14 passes to January 21, blocked by March 3, rebound by February 7. And you just see this clustering to a couple of days. And the reason is, if you look at how youth sports leagues are, the best thing for you is to be the oldest kid that just misses the age cutoff. Because when you're little, that extra year of growth will typically make you larger than the competition. If you're larger, typically what does that mean? typically means you're better. Not always. But as a rule of thumb, bigger kids at a young age should be better than smaller kids. So if you're better, the coach thinks, oh, this kid's better. Let me give this kid more playing time. Let me give this kid more practice, more training. Let me nominate this kid for the various things. And so a very small discrepancy gets magnified, magnified, magnified as you propagate through the system. And so what this was saying is we are missing a huge segment of the population because of how we're doing sports leagues. Now the question is, of course, well, what are the alternatives? You, know, you don't want kids at you know, too great of an age difference playing with each other. Do you do it more based on skills? Do you try to have teams balanced by skills? And maybe you know, this second grader is good enough to play with the fourth graders. But this third grader is not good enough, and this third grader should actually be playing with the first graders. Then there are all sort of parental issues with something like that. But it's good things to think about. So there's a lot of good stuff we've seen in the birthday problem. We've seen, again, infinite series. We've seen you know, the logarithm breaking up a product into sums. We've seen Taylor series. We've seen approximating a complicated function with a simpler one. We've seen formulas for sums. And then we you know, all combine them at the end. We have a formula. And we can now generalize this. And we can replace the 365 with n days in a year. And if you wanted to, you could go through and do a higher level analysis. What if we kept the next term in the expansion? What if we kept the negative x squared over 2? How much of a change would that have down here? And you'll see that the change is not that great. This is a really good assumption to simplify the analysis. OK. Any questions on the birthday problem? OK, so we've seen now three major problems. We saw the birthday problem. We saw the hoops problem, and we saw on the first day of class the uh, sports betting problem. And I apologize that the video cut out for that part. It's entirely coincidental that it was when I was praising the New York Giants. <laughs> I really don't know how that happened. We're now ready to start the subject in earnest. Okay, this is chapter two. Now the problem is, uh, how many of you have taken a graduate class in measure theory? All right, we've got one. So it would be wonderful if you could all go home and learn measure theory by Wednesday. <laughs> Somehow I think with all the other stuff going on that this is not a reasonable uh, assignment to give you. So this is going to be a class that does not have a detailed real analysis prerequisite. What I will try to do is give you a sense of what do you need to do to make the subject rigorous. Partly what we're going to do is we're going to restrict ourselves in terms of what events we talk about. 
So it's not possible to assign probabilities to every possible sub-collection of events. We will restrict ourselves to a simple sub-collection that will be sufficient for all the applications we have in mind. A discrete set, no problem. A discrete finite set, no problem. All right, for the discrete set, I, I'll, I'll mean a countable set. So think of the integers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So my outcome is going to be a positive number. Maybe it's how many tosses of the coin I need before it becomes a hit. Okay? Or maybe I'll talk about probabilities of intervals or subsets of intervals. Well, I've got to be very careful. I won't be able to consider an arbitrary subset of an interval. I'll be able to consider unions of intervals and maybe intersections of intervals and maybe finite unions and finite and your stuff like that. And you start playing games to get what's the widest space you can talk about. And so for our practical purposes, it's going to be talking about sets where we can assign uh, nice pictures, nice, nice sets. So a circle, a nice subsets of a circle, you know, a square inside a circle, regions like this, we want to be able to assign probabilities. There are strange things called unmeasurable sets or non-measurable sets. I can't describe them, they're that bad. We will not be able to assign probabilities to them. Fortunately, they don't really come up in what we're doing, but you have to be aware. So I want to end the day with Russell's paradox. And this is one of the greatest ah shit moments in mathematics. So Frege was developing his theory of sets, and then Russell said, well, what about the following? And the entire theory comes crumbling down. Okay, so everybody, I hope, has a notion of a set. A set is a collection of elements. Right? So I could think the set could be ball players on the Boston Red Sox. You know, David Ortiz would be in that. I could have a set of NFL commissioners who don't understand the ideal gas law. <laughs> Anybody want to give me an element of that set? Goodell, great example. In fact, he's the only element in that set. So the set is not empty, but it does have one element. I could think of years the Seattle Mariners have won the World Series. That would be an empty set. I apologize if there's anybody <laughs> from Seattle here. All right. The empty set is one of the most important sets in mathematics. So I, I want to do this today because we already did the geometric series, which has R. If I can do Russell's set, which also has R as a Bostonian, I can get all the R's done at the beginning of the semester. So R is the set of all X such that X is not an element of X. Okay, so if I think of the set of all ball players in the Boston Red Sox, the elements of that are the ball players. It's not the set of ball players. Most things are not elements of themselves. Robert Goodell is not an element of himself. Okay, so here's my question. What is the most, I want to know if R contains a certain element. What do you think the most natural element to investigate? R. Is R an element of R? How many options are there? Two. If yes, so if R is an R, R is the collection of all things that are not elements of themselves, therefore what can we deduce? R is not an R. All right, therefore, since that case led to a contradiction, I don't even have to bother doing this case. It has to be the no. Oh, we've got an extra minute of class. I've got to fill something of I. Well, let's look at that. All right. If R is not an element of R, what can we deduce? R is an R. Because R is a set of all things that are not elements of the self. Therefore, R is an R. And we get a contradiction. So what this means is you cannot just collect together all objects with a given property and call that a set. The notion of a set is a bit more complicated than you would expect. Right? There's a lot of interesting mathematics behind this in terms of making everything rigorous. So it turns out that there is one set that's very easy to understand. What is the easiest set to understand? The empty set. So we start off with the empty set. I can now build a set from the empty set. Anybody know what set I can build? The set containing the empty set. And I can build a set, another set. What set could I build? The set, the, the set of the set containing the empty set. And in fact, I'm going to build this set. And actually, I'll do it the other way. I'll do the empty set 
and then the set containing the empty set. And I'll do one more. It'll be the empty set, the set containing the empty set, and the set containing the empty set, and the set containing the empty set. This is zero. This is one, this is two, this is three. Notice one is a subset of two. Notice two is a subset of three. So less than can be done through inclusion. This is a way to build the natural numbers. We will never do this again. <laughs> but it's good to at least see it once and get some idea of what do we do in real analysis. We find ways to make all of this stuff rigorous. And you have to make this stuff rigorous. Russell's paradox tells us the dangers of assuming. It seemed very reasonable to say, let's just collect everything that has a property and call that a set. Unfortunately, that leads to contradictions. So when we build up our probability, we have to be careful. Okay.